And uh, here to talk about not just John Means is his no-hitter, but so much other great stuff, baseball and beer. We got uh, Jay Jaffe with us right now from Fangraphs.com, or you can follow on Twitter at J underscore Jaffe. Oh, the timing could not be better today. First off, Jay, uh, welcome back. John Means has already been off to a great start this season, and all he did today was put a big exclamation point on that with a no-hitter against a Seattle on the road. Let's talk about just how ridiculous uh, he looked and how good he's been all season, really, for the O's. Yeah, I, I only saw the eighth and ninth innings here, but uh, it was pretty cool to see. Uh, I heard that he had, he had thrown first pitch strikes to 26 of the 27 batters he faced, uh, and the only thing separating him from a perfect game uh, was was a was a, a drop third strike uh, wild pitch uh, in which a runner reached that has never happened before uh, to 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 blow a perfect game. It's a it's a silly rule to begin with. It's got to be a little bit agonizing uh, that that's all that stood between him and him and perfection. But uh, um, really an outstanding performance. And, and you're right, he's been very good this year. Uh, came in with a 170 ERA. Uh, has been. Uh, uh, you know, very solid on a team that uh, otherwise is, is uh, generally not. Uh, the Orioles are already back in, la- in last place uh, in the American League East, but uh, he's been their best pitcher for a while. So, you know, if you're going to pick uh, one Oriole to do it, uh, it's him. Uh, what's remarkable to me, you know, given, you know, I mean, the, the current, the current uh, uh, roster is one thing, but uh, given their history, you'd have to go, you, you still have to go back to 1969, the year I was born, when Jim Palmer uh, through a complete game no hitter to find the last one of those uh, in Orioles history. I mean, you know, they had great pitching in the 70s with Palmer and uh, all those Earl Weaver teams and some good pitching uh, uh, in the 80s as well, but uh, no no hitters uh, for 51 years. I'm surprised Musina never did it in all the years he was right. pitching. The right. There's, yeah, a great, a great example. Musina, uh, Mike Flanagan. I mean, there's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of strong pitchers over the years uh, haven't done it. I mean, maybe. You know, the Camden Yards era, uh, given how conducive that place is for for hitters, uh, we shouldn't be that surprised. But uh, uh, still, you know, it's 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 been a long time. That's very cool. So I'm happy we lead off the show with that. Obviously, Yankee fans are psyched up. I've heard the um, between the F Altuve chants going on in the Bronx right now and uh, the Yanks uh, bringing inflatable uh, garbage cans. They're all they've been waiting for this for a while. Now they finally get those Astros. And obviously yesterday uh, was exactly what the Yankees are looking for. But let's be honest. I mean, you mentioned the Orioles are in last place. They're one game under 500. The Yanks are one game over 500 in second place. That's how tight the AL East race is right now. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, they, the Red Sox are, are, are clearly atop the division there at, uh, at 18 and 12. But you're right, the other teams, the other four teams are separated by a game. Um I'm always reminded of uh, the way Joe Torre broke it down back when he was managing the Yankees. Get to 500, then get above 500. Yeah. Very simple. It's just <laughs> baseball's an easy game. That's all you have to do. Get to 500 and get above 500. But the Yankees, uh, uh, they did hit a soft spot in their schedule. They were able to, to beat up on the Tigers this past weekend uh, to get themselves to 500. Uh, they've, been, they've been playing better on both sides of the ball. Uh, Giancarlo Stanton is on fire. Uh, Kyle Higashioka has, has taken over the starting catching job, and he has uh, uh, done uh, better than Gary Sanchez on both sides of the ball. I wrote about that controversial situation last week, um, but uh, you know, there's there's some optimism. I was surprised. I wasn't surprised with the vitriol that was that was hurled at the Astros yesterday. I'm surprised there wasn't a garbage truck thrown at, thrown at the team. Maybe <laughs> uh, you know because the Yankees. Uh, now, the Yankees ran into those Astros, and they were just one win away from going to the World Series in 2017. So there is a lot of ill will here. Um, and uh, I don't think anybody here has any sympathy for what the Astros are going through. Uh, no doubt about it. And that's I, I agree with that completely. And then I look at uh, the other, you know, the other pitching matchups uh, that uh, you know, a lot of baseball fans are excited about and, and getting ready for tonight. We've got young Luis Garcia against Jordan Montgomery. So not nearly the, uh, you know, the, the, the pizzazz of, the, of yesterday's matchup. And then Lance McCullers, Garrett Cole should be a pretty good one tomorrow morning from the stadium. Yeah, I mean, you know, Garrett Cole facing his old team, that's, uh, uh, that's appointment viewing. Cole has, has gotten off to a very strong start this year. Um, you know, the rest of the Yankee rotation has been kind of shaky, although that outing that Corey Kluber had uh, uh, this weekend against the Tigers, eight innings, two hits, 10 strikeouts. 
uh, it was pretty vintage Corey Kluber. So um, if he's coming around, uh, this team is, is, is going to be in a lot better shape. Talking baseball right now with Jay Jaffe from Fangraphs.com. You wrote about the other New York team uh, today on the website. The Mets make a mess of their offensive struggles. It's up right now at Fangraphs.com. It's been a weird start for the Mets, especially Francisco Lindor, who you know just cannot hit a baseball out of the gate. The, the uh, Mets are down 2 nothing, by the way, to St. Louis uh, in, in that one as they – get started with uh, that that contest. And I'm looking right now, and other than Pete Alonzo and uh, Kevin Pillar, there's no hits. Two hits the whole game off of uh, Kim. So, you know, you look at Lindor, he's in the leadoff spot. He's batting 159. So what do they do? They fire their hitting coach. They get rid of Chili Davis. And also uh, they you know, get rid of uh, Tom Slater. Uh, and and I, I don't know. You tell me, Jay. Uh, are the Mets jumping the gun because they fired the guys right after they scored like 14 runs over their previous two games? Yeah, I mean, the timing of it is strange. You know, they're, this is the third time that Shelly Davis has been fired from a hit, from a hit coach job in, in four years. And, and every time it's been said, uh, that, you know, whatever he's doing, he's, he's too old school, is not in line with the analytically driven direction that the team wants to go. Uh, this happened in Boston. This happened in Chicago with the Cubs. And now it's happened here. We, the Mets just had a regime change. They had an ownership change. Uh, they brought in a new general manager. He got fired because of his history of sending sexually explicit texts. But Zach Scott, the assistant general manager, who, or the acting general manager, uh, was the assistant. Now he's the acting who took over was part of that Boston front office that, that let Davis go in 2017. I don't see how you don't get, you know, if you're going to make a move, make the move in the off season. Yeah. Okay. This is, you know, I mean, like the Chili Davis is, you know, is a, is a, was a popular player in his day and he had, you know, some people believe he's a good coach, but you know, he's maybe not the right coach at the right time for the, for this, you know, for the, for the teams that he's worked for do him at least do him right and, 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 and let him go when he can find another job. Uh, it, this is only the, I, th- I think this is the uh, third earliest firing in the last quarter century of a, of a hitting coach, which is just, I mean, that just speaks to a horrible process. Um, you know, and, and the, that the Mets did it at 1140 something at night remind uh, reminded us of the, uh, uh, the Willie Randolph firing in 2008. They were on the West coast. It was three at three twelve AM New York time when he got the, uh, uh, can 12 12 local in, in Anaheim. I mean, just, you know, find an off day or, or, or announce it after an afternoon game. There's no urgency to this. It was just poorly done. Yes, you're right. They had just scored a, a bunch of runs in their, in their last two or three games, uh, but they had scored seven runs over their previous five games. I mean, if, you know, if they need, there's an argument to be made that they needed it, but just the timing was weird and poorly handled. Have we ever done a deep dive into hitting coaches in Major League Baseball and trying to see how many of them are old school like Chile versus the new, you know, analytical sabermetric approach? I certainly haven't. And I, you know, I'm a little skeptical. I, I think it's I think it's too easy to pigeonhole these guys uh, sometimes. But, uh, you know, this the the impression I got was that. Uh, uh, you know, Davis is averse to the, to the phrase launch angle and the belief that, that hitters ought to be trying to hit the ball in the air more, um, preaches a more all fields approach, which is fine. Uh, the problem, the, the problem comes is, you know, when you're not going to use the data that the front office is providing you. And that's where there's, that's where there's friction. Um, you know, you want to tailor your approach to, to suit the needs of, of all these very different hitters. Um, you know, it's not that he didn't put it in the work. It's not that, that, the, that the, uh, uh, the players who are struggling, including Lindor, haven't put in the work. Uh, the results aren't there. What I tried to show in my piece today is that the Mets are actually hitting the ball a little bit harder than last year when they were one of the better offensive teams in the league. It's, the results haven't been there. Uh, Lindor, especially, he's now in an 0 for 23 slide. He's a mess mechanically. Yeah. Uh, his lower body is way out of sync and he's lunging at balls and trying to pull them while, while, while moving his feet uh, badly. Um, but, uh, you know, there's I, there, obviously you sign a $341 million contract. You might, you might feel, be feeling the pressure. You're changing teams. You might be feeling the pressure. Um, so these things are understandable. I think the Mets will come around. But, boy, the, you know, it's, it, it's, off, it's, it's just a mess right now. Jay Jaffe is with us every week from Fangraphs.com. You can follow Jay on Twitter at Jay underscore Jaffe and check out his work at Fangraphs.com. In fact, 
He wrote a story just a few days ago about uh, Dustin May and uh, the breakthrough cut short by Tommy John surgery. This was tough to watch, and you can always tell the reaction of a pitcher when something bad happens. And Jay, you just kind of knew when you watched him shake his arm after that fastball that something was wrong. And sure enough, it confirmed the worst fears, the UCL tear, the Tommy John surgery, and, and ultimately a Dodger team that looked like they had so much starting pitching going into the season because they did. But now you look at injuries to Gonsolin, David Price, and of course, Dustin May out for the next year plus, and suddenly the Dodgers are scrambling a little bit in that five hole. Yeah, they're you know they're just a few games above 500. They're they've gone four and 12 after starting the season 13 and two. They've been the worst team in the National League for for the last three weeks. Uh, it's tough. May, um, you know, the stuff for him was finally matching the uh, the 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 style. I, you know, he is he's he's a guy who can hit 100 on the gun. Uh, incredible movement on on his uh, two seamer and his cutter. Uh, good developments on his curveball. He was the strikeouts were there uh, this year where they weren't there last year. He really was pitching as well as anybody in that rotation. And then all of a sudden, uh, snap. Now, the thing is, to the extent that we know anything about preventing these dumb elbow injuries, uh, the guys who are throwing high velocity, throwing fastballs more than 50% of the time, that's the high risk group. And May was certainly in the high risk group because he throws as hard as anybody in the game. Um you know, it's it's. Uh, we'll be interesting to see how, how much that velocity he brings back, and how long the Dodgers keep him out. And there's talk that he might not be even be even be back until uh, 2023, which would which would be a bummer. Um, you know, teams have gotten more and more, uh, I think, protective of the young arms. They don't want to bring them back from Tommy John surgery too quickly because they've seen that that often, uh, you know, can 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 cause further problems. Uh, either with other injuries or in some cases blowing out that 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 uh, UCL ligament before it's even fully healed. You know, you look at the exceptions to the rule. You got Nolan Ryan obviously threw so hard for so long and and never had to, to deal with Tommy John surgery. Uh, Justin Verlander avoided for a long, long time, and then it finally got to him. Um, but for the most part, there aren't too many guys that throw super hard that haven't had the surgery. And then you look at a guy like Jake DeGrom. I know it's not an elbow injury, but he throws harder than ever and is so unbelievable. You just kind of wonder, is he a ticking time bomb? Is it a matter of time or can he avoid it like uh, like Nolan did? Yeah, I mean, you know, DeGrom has gained like a mile an hour every year for the last like seven years. It's it's astounding. I mean, he has he's thrown more 100 mile an hour pitches than anybody in the majors this year. He only threw his first one last year. You know, it's just like creeping up. And he's yeah. he's he, he he throws a lot of fastballs, not quite not quite half, but uh, uh, enough that you want to be concerned and you hope maybe he could dial it back just a little bit. You know, be on the safe side. Um, but boy, his performance has just been unreal. And the fact that the Mets have continued to struggle with, you know, even in his starts has just been, I think, one of the most frustrating things about uh, uh, about the, this team right now. Great point. Hey, meanwhile, Giants are in first place in the NL West, Jay, 18 and 12 on the season. And uh, they are currently uh, trailing uh, Colorado 6-2. I think that one's in the sixth. And Obviously, it's in Colorado, so a lot could happen quickly. Uh, the Giants have been an amazing story under Gabe Kapler. They really have. And you look at Buster Posey's resurgence. He's turned the clock back, and it's not just hitting for average, but the power's returned for about the first time in six or seven years. Yeah, he's you know he's got seven home runs already. He, he that's as many as he hit in in uh, in 2019 uh, after coming back from hip surgery. He only had six in 2018, I believe. Um, you know, he's able to use his lower half again. Um, this is, you know, it, it certainly helps that that uh, uh, that uh, uh, his ballpark has become somewhat more conducive to home runs for right-handed hitters than it was a few years ago. But uh, he is really just looking great at the plate right now. Uh, and the Giants are a great story. Farhan Zaidi, who was formerly the Dodgers general manager, is now the Giants uh, president of baseball operations, uh, has had to remake the roster over the last a couple of years. He's done a great job hitting on a lot of guys that uh, uh, were kind of cast offs. Uh, Mike Yastrzemski, Donovan Solano, uh, Kevin Gosman uh, turned these guys in, into, uh, uh, in, into uh, above average players, uh, you know, on the Giants watch. And, uh, and they've had some success and there's probably a few more. They're, they're kind of at a critical juncture though. Uh, Posey can be a free agent after this year. So can Brandon Belt and Brandon Crawford. Uh, those guys are the last links to the to the title teams. You can't hold on to everybody forever. 
Uh, it's probably time to turn the page on 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 uh, on on some of these guys. Uh, but I I, I think uh, Posey's option right now looks like if he keeps hitting like this, of course the Giants are gonna are gonna uh, uh, pick up his option. They'll start building the statue outside the uh, you know outside the stadium uh, as soon as as soon as they do. If he stays healthy and continues to produce, could you see Posey if he finishes strong with his career, put himself in a chance in a shot to go to Cooperstown? Look, I already think that if Buster Posey decided to retire tomorrow, I, he would be on my ballot. Okay. Um, when you account, especially when, once you account for the value of his pitch framing, which has been elite over the course of his career, uh, he has done as much as any Hall of Fame catcher has by, according to, you know, if you, uh, if you tweak the Jaws method uh, to account for that. Uh, the problem is longevity. Um, he, you know, he's, he's uh, only at about 1,400 hits. Nobody with fewer than 2,000 has been elected uh, uh, since since uh, uh, the uh, post the post 1960 expansion era, um, you know, and because uh, uh, because he's been so banged up, you know, he missed that full season, uh, pretty much a full season with a broken leg, uh, missed about half a season or a quarter of a season with the hip surgery, uh, you know, and, and then and then all of last year uh, opting out. It's uh, um, you know, there's a lot of missed time in there, and and. Uh, uh, I worry that he's going to be viewed uh, uh, as having too short a career, but he's checked every box. MVP, Rookie of the Year, uh, three-time champion, Gold Glove. Uh, you really can't do a whole a whole lot more than he has uh, other than stay around forever. Jay, tell me a little bit about what you're going to be uh, writing about here at Fangraphs the next couple of days. Uh, right now I'm working on something about the Angels. Uh, they uh, remade their rotation. It looked pretty good, you know, Relatively speaking, they had Shohei Otani back. They have a six-man rotation. Um, their playoff odds were were as high as uh, as high as they've been since 2016. Uh, yet they have struggled sub 500. Their their rotation ERA is about five and a half. Uh, a lot of that is due to their shoddy defense, though. And I'm kind of going to kind of dig into the numbers and show that uh, they've they've been uh, underperforming relative to their peripheral stats and. Uh, um, you know, this is something they'll probably come around on as their defense improves with more uh, more Anthony Rendon in the field and maybe less Justin Upton. But uh, uh, it's it's been shaky. In terms of your stories at Fangraphs, do you pretty much have freedom to write about whatever you want? Do you pitch ideas to your editors? And when you get to go ahead, you start writing. How does the process work for you? Yeah, I you know, every day I, I try to look and see, I, you know, see what what's what's newsworthy, first of all. Um, I'll shift gears. Like I've had this Angels thing kind of on my back burner for a few days, but uh, uh, the Dustin May injury uh, came up and I was like, oh, better get on that. Um, I have pretty much free reign. Just got to make sure that nobody else is uh, writing, you know, writing on the uh, same topic. We, we have uh, we have a Slack channel, so we kind of do, do our, uh, our air traffic control to make sure that nobody's trying to land on the same runway. Um, occasionally we have our editor, uh, managing editor, uh, sorted it out for us, but, uh, um, you know, I could write about anything and I usually, you know, coming from my days at sports illustrated, uh, I'm always looking for what's the big news of the day. Does it, is there, is there some kind of, you know, statistical based angle, uh, that we can bring to this or, uh, is there a player I'm interested in and, and is there something I'm finding with this, uh, uh, suddenly strong or, or weak performance like Buster Posey, you know, just, I'm always, I'm always looking for those guys. Uh, those bounce back guys and those fall off guys, especially if there's a Hall of Fame component, that's what people like to see from me. Um, you know, every day it's like a, sometimes it comes at four o'clock or five o'clock, and I don't have an idea, and then suddenly I'll get news about something from a, from you know one of the one of the clubhouses opening up, and there it is. But sometimes it's just like, oh, what am I going to write about? What am I going to write about? And and uh, you know always pull the rabbit out of the hat but <laughs> right on. some days some days it's tighter than others i understand hey let's wrap it up uh, beer pick of the week what would you like to profile for our listeners this week jay all right well this is one from that nice little care package that your friends at uh, lakewood brewing company sent me um this is their their big d ipa number one uh this was a really nice beer unfortunately i don't have the, the can still uh this was a uh a hazy IPA that uh, uh, had a, a, a dry hop with Mandarina, Bavaria, and Azaka hops. I know Azaka from, from some uh, Founders uh, single hop uh, blends I had a few years ago that I liked a lot, but it's a nice orange citrus, a little bit of mango, 
uh, really, really nice. It reminded me a lot, actually, of and I, I unfortunately I don't I don't have the actual uh, um, uh, didn't actually log the beer, but one of the great uh, uh, entries in the uh, Firestone Walker Luponic Distortion series that I really, really liked that I had at uh, uh, the dearly departed Foley's Bar uh, a, a few years ago. Uh, this one reminded me of that. It must have been the same hops, probably the Azaka, maybe the Mandarina as well. Just a really beautiful uh, beer, sweet and piney, uh, and uh, just hit all the right notes for an IPA. And uh, if, I, if I saw a six pack of that in my local, I would buy it. Very nice. Jay Jaffe, folks, follow him on Twitter at J underscore Jaffe. Check out his work at fangraphs.com. Until next week, Jay, appreciate the time and the insight. And uh, as always, the beer review. All right. Sure thing, Steve. Thanks a lot. You got it.